Hello everyone, my name is Ana Maria Bucalo and together with Mikael Fernandez, Alia Defi and Miriam Delay, we have reviewed the current guidelines in endoscopy regarding the impact that the COVID-19 epidemic had in our daily practice. Today's presentation will focus on providing a summary of recommendations and guidelines for performing endoscopies during this pandemic. More specifically, we will look at general measures that can be taken to help, help GI department in the hospital, screening, pre-endoscopy, endoscopy, post-endoscopy. Post then we will share a few words about COVID-19 modes of transmission before finishing with looking at transmission risks associated with COVID-19 for endoscopic treatment. In December 2019, the outbreak of COVID-19 disease spread from its original cluster in Hubei province, China, throughout the world, and was later classified as being a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March 11, 2020. Since then, in the initial days, among the 93 international and national endoscopic societies, 21 of them elaborated specific recommendations for endoscopy during this pandemic. In the next set of slides, we will develop and highlight a few of these recommendations, mainly from the international societies. Let's see a summary of these recommendations uh, written during this COVID-19 pandemic. Of the 21 GI societies, 95 recommended temporarily postponing elective and non-urgent procedures. 86% recommended stratifying patients for risk of COVID-19 before the examination, with questionnaires regarding symptoms and or taking patients' body temperature. All societies recommended the use of personal protective equipment, PPE, during the examination, gloves, masks, goggles or face shields, gown and hairnet, double gloves and the use of N95 respirators or FFP2 or 3 masks were recommended in highly suspected or, or confirmed cases. Surprisingly, 67% of those recommendations did not report the use of masks for patients. Almost 50% of recommend, uh, recommended that the endoscopy team must be trained in wearing and removing PPE. All international societies recommended following a standardized reprocessing procedure for, pre, uh, for flexible endoscopes. We will review the recommendations by looking at some of the general measures that can be introduced to mitigate risks related to endoscopy, then we will say a few words about screening before talking about measures that should be taken before, during and after endoscopy. We will begin with general measures. First, planning and reorganizing of the endoscopy unit is necessary for patient and staff safety. The endoscopy unit should be divided into zones identifying both a contaminated zone and a clean zone with clear boundaries and buffer areas in between. Creation of one-way passages and routes are needed to prevent cross-contamination. All endoscopists, nurses and healthcare providers should receive training in control and on appropriate use of personal pr protective equipment. All units should have a triage section at the entrance of the unit with adequate level of PPE. If possible, all cases at high risk or confirmed COVID-19 should be performed in a negative pressure room. The last, but not the least, the use of medical supplies should be carefully planned. Administrators of the endoscopy center should regularly communicate with the hospital administration about the supply and logistics of medical equipment and PPE. The stock and use of PPE and other equipment should be monitored daily to allow better planning of service and to avoid inadequate supply of PPE, which may impact the safety and morale of staff. Conservation of PPE is critical and only essential personnel should be present during procedures. 
In this table, you can see that in case of exponential increase in COVID-19 cases, PPE supply is critical and only urgent endoscopic procedures should be done. This is regularly adapted depending on the curve of COVID-19 cases. During the pandemic, the majority of countries recommended to postpone non-urgent cases. But what does urgent cases mean? ESG recommend to assess GI disease-related morbidity and mortality, as we will see in the next slides. For US, it included upper GI bleeding, foreign body obstruction, acute cholangitis, care for cancer, and prostatic removals. The health organization from the UK and the Asian Pacific region added the urgent inpatient nutrition support, perforation, and leaks. Finally, pancreatic infected collections were also included in the UK advice. According to ESG guidelines, for elective procedure, you assess the morbidity and mortality risk of GI disease versus risk of COVID-19. If you have a higher risk of COVID-19 related morbidity or mortality, you can postpone the endoscopy. If you have a higher risk of GI disease related morbidity or mortality, then you will perform the endoscopy taking into account the patient risk stratification of COVID-19, as we will see in a few minutes. ESG has established a list of procedures which should always be performed versus those which should be postponed. The following procedures should always be performed as acute GI bleeding, capsule or enteroscopy for acute bleeding, anemia with hemodynamic instability, foreign body obstruction, obstructive jaundice, and cholangitis. And the list of procedures to postpone as diagnostic procedures of IBS symptoms, surveillance of Barrett's, cases of reflux or bariatric procedures. Finally, they established a case-by-case -case assessment based upon medical necessity, high-priority procedures who have to be scheduled within the next 12 weeks, and low-priority procedures that could wait a bit longer. Now, a few words about screening. All societies recommended screening for respiratory and GI symptoms, such as diarrhea, and FTOCC, which means fever, travel, occupation, contact, and clustering. Regarding chest CT and COVID-19 testing, the majority of international and national societies do not recommend to perform CT preemptively. However, this screening was done in the city of Wuhan. Furthermore, COVID-19 testing is not specified by the majority of national and international guidelines, but ESG recommends it if available. Let's continue with pre-endoscopy measures. It is recommended to call patients one day before a GI endoscopy and ask them about any symptoms that might be experiencing and of contact that they might have had with people with COVID-19. And, when available, results of any COVID-19 testing by PCR or immunity. Also, on the day of the procedure, you should take the temperature and ask for respiratory symptoms and FTOCC, as described before. During the patient assessment on the day of endoscopy, the use of surgical masks is recommended by some societies for both the healthcare providers and the patient. Other recommendations include enough physical spacing, physical barrier, it is mandatory to wash hands with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub before and after all patient interactions, after contact with potential infectious sources, and before putting and removal of PPE, including gloves. No visitors are allowed unless patients require specific assistance or translation service. Let's move on to measures related to endoscopy itself. 
Given the fact that there was no data present on whether endoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure, risk stratification has been established regarding the practice of endoscopy. This table depicts chronologically international guidelines which have been reported on risk stratification of COVID-19 among patients. First, patients with low risk to present COVID-19 infection were defined as exhibiting no symptoms such as cough, fever, difficulty breathing, diarrhea, having no contact with a COVID positive person and having not stayed in a high risk area. The rapid spread of COVID-19 infection has led other international societies to adapt the initial definition of low risk. Basically, ESG modified the high risk area by a location reporting community transmission and added negative testing for COVID-19. The Asian Pacific Society summarized the previous features by the acronym FTOCC – Fever, Travel, Occupation, Contact and Clustering. A patient FTOCC negative and asymptomatic is considered to have a low risk of COVID-19 infection. Secondly, although during the beginning of the outbreak intermediate risk was suggested, the ESG did not provide specifications regarding intermediate risk. The Asian Pacific Society did consider the patients FTOCC negative with respiratory symptoms in a location where testing is not available to have intermediate risk. Lastly, high risk definition followed the same path as low risk and was defined by the presence of symptoms with adequate sensitivity by the ESG, more specifically cough, fever, shortness of breath or diarrhea. The definitions previously presented were essential to help healthcare professionals pre-screen and triage patients for endoscopy. Patients with low risk, in other words, presenting features like FTOCC positive with COVID test negative or FTOCC negative and asymptomatic, should undergo endoscopy both for urgent, semi-urgent and elective procedures. During the procedure, just enhanced PPE and infection control is recommended. Patients with intermediate risk of COVID-19, more specifically FTOCC negative with respiratory symptoms and COVID-19 testing not available, should only have urgent endoscopy with enhanced PPE and infection control in a negative pressure room. Lastly, high-risk patients, meaning presence of FTOCC and respiratory symptoms, as well as positive COVID-19 testing, should only have urgent endoscopy with the previous same recommendations of precaution. Standard PPE of, for non-suspected non or test-negative cases are the same for all endoscopy procedures and comprise surgical masks or N95 respirators, blue isolation gowns and gloves in a standard endoscopy room. However, for high-risk and confirmed COVID-19 patients, N95 respirators, goggles or face shields should complete the protection and the procedure should be done in a negative pressure room. The endoscopist should be at a specialist level and helped by two endoscopy nurses. Regarding the contamination risk according to the type of procedure, upper GI examinations are considered to be at high risk and lower GI endoscopies as at moderate risk. Who should do the procedures? Where urgent endoscopies are necessary, experienced endoscopists and two nurses are recommended. Only essential and fully trained endoscopy personnel should be present. And what about training? All the societies agreed that the training should be limited or suspended during this period. 
Finally, we shall discuss the post-endoscopy management. Regarding endoscope disinfection, standard manual cleaning followed by high-level disinfection appear to be effective at eradicating this coronavirus. Disinfectants should be tested according to European standards. No changes to the reprocessing and storage of GI endoscopes were recommended and the ESG indicated to follow published guidelines. Nevertheless, you should consider to limit reprocessing to experienced staff with documented competency. All endoscopes should undergo full standard reprocessing prior to return to manufacturer for maintenance. How may we prevent transmission during reprocessing? Let's start with patient to staff transmission. There was no evidence to support special handling of endoscopes in known COVID-19 positive patients. Pre-cleaning should commence in the procedure room as per protocol. Personnel should be, equipped, should be equipped with protective equipment that include gloves, gowns, face shields, hats and masks, ideally N95 respirators. Transportation should be done in a fully enclosed and labelled container. There was no changes in recommendations regarding staff to patients transmission. Fully dry endoscopes should be used in order to prevent outbreak of waterborne organisms. The exterior on the, of the endoscope should be cleaned with a clean lint-free cloth and the interior on the, of the endoscope should be dried with prolonged flow of medical air through all accessible channels for at least 10 minutes. How should procedure rooms should be cleaned after each patient during this pandemic? Meticulous cleaning should be performed after each procedure and medical waste and linen should be removed from each room according to unit policy. Cleaning and disinfecting of the entire unit at the end of the day is to be done according to unit policy. There are some, slightly, uh, some slight changes when we deal with confirmed COVID-19 patient. Extra time should be taken after each procedure to permit air changes. Adequate aeration time is to be determined by your facility, for example, one hour. The CDC recommends, where available, to use negative pressure rooms and in this case aeration time may be abbreviated, about 30 minutes. The patient recovery should be done in separated recovery rooms for suspected and or confirmed COVID-19 patients. Early use of reversal agents after sedatives should be considered in order to avoid respiratory failure and, and decreased consciousness. Staff should be trained on updated CPR for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients. After the procedure, the patient should be contacted at 7 and 14 days to inquire about any new COVID-19 diagnosis or development of symptoms. If present, the patient should be referred to seek medical attention and all staff who have been exposed should be contacted. Finally, we shall discuss the transmission risk of COVID-19 to the endoscopy staff. The transmission of COVID-19 to the healthcare personnel during uh, endoscopy can occur can occur by inhalation of airborne droplets, conjunctival contact and potential fecal-oral transmission. Let's take a closer look to the fecal-oral transmission. It has been observed that GI symptoms present early and mild onset and are frequently followed by typical respiratory manifestations. Common GI features are diarrhea, nausea, vomiting and abdominal discomfort. Recent Zhejiang province analysis reports a rate of patients with GI symptoms of 11.4%. Nevertheless, it can reach 35%. Current studies imply that this coronavirus 
may be shedding through stool in some patients. Nevertheless, the presence of viable virions or fecal transmission is still unknown. Further research on potential fecal oral transmission and the possible significance and or sequelae of viral presence in the GI tract is needed. This is an interesting study of Alessandro Ripici that was recently published in GUT. 802 patients completed a survey after a GI endoscopy. Only 8 patients developed mild respiratory symptoms and none of them needed hospitalization. Interestingly, zero cases were observed among the 26 staff members. On a broader scale, more precisely 41 hospitals of northern Italy, out of 968 healthcare workers, 42 were tested positive for COVID-19, amongst which 23 physicians, 6 needed in hospital care. It is important, quite essential I might say, to note that 86% of the 42 cases appeared before introduction of PPE and before case selection. We therefore can conclude that GI endoscopy appears to be relatively safe for patients and healthcare um, workers when using adequate PPE. Nevertheless, caution is needed because this coronavirus may be present in the stool of patients with and without symptoms and viral shedding occurs. It may persist despite negative results in respiratory tract. And recent studies show that a prolonged presence uh, of viral RNA in fecal samples is present up to seven, 47 days in one patient after the onset of first symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention and I would like to invite you to our 38th endoscopy workshop that will take place in sunny Brussels next June. And of course, don't forget, stay safe. Bye bye.